Um, so no, it, it, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I think that this, uh, the initial panel that came before this one created a great deal of, of necessary context. Um, but there is a story to be told, and some of you have had the opportunity to preview this story. Um, I saw the first four episodes and was moved. I, I, I think like many of us, we're never sure how a piece of content is going to touch us, if it's going to touch us if, at all. And as those of us that, that find our history important, um, there's even more invested in content that begins to try to tell a story that is supposed to be real. And so I was, I'm appreciative to be, thank you, a part of this panel. Um, but I want you all to, to be able to see, you're going to see a, a, little, a, a few pieces uh, before the creative team comes up uh, and talks a little bit about this production. And so to come forward uh, to bring remarks is Peter Ligori, uh, who is the President and CEO of Tribune Media. Please give him a round of applause as he comes. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and also, on behalf of everyone in the room and me personally, I want to thank the professors for such a illustrative, terrific speech. Uh, and session. Personally, the reason why I want to thank you is <clears throat> in college I majored in antebellum Southern history. I wrote my senior thesis about slave ministers. And hearing your brilliance, witnessing your commitment to research, and hearing your passion, I'm at peace that I disappointed my parents <laughs> by pursuing a career in television. <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying how deeply moving it is to be in this place screening this series at this particular time in history. I'm grateful to everyone who brought us here, uh, the incredible creative people who wrote, directed, and acted in this wonderful series, my colleagues at WGN America, and certainly at Sony, who fought to develop this show and bring it to air. And everyone at the White House, uh, we're all deeply honored with your interest and commitment to the show. Look, our job at WGN America is to make commercial television shows. But I think I'm presumptuous enough to say that I think we do this in a particularly distinctive and especially meaningful way. We tell quintessential American stories, relevant stories that may be set in the past but aim to examine, comment on, and resonate authentically and loudly in the present. Salem, which is a show set in, in the time of the witch trials, but underneath it, this is really a story about the perils of dogma. We may call it today red and blue, and heaven forbid you inject a little bit of purple in there. What winds up happening, you run the risk of being ostracized, or even worse. When I look at our show Manhattan, which deals with the moral complexity that's still with us today, as we're the only nuclear power to have ever dropped an atomic weapon. Outsiders, it's a series set on a mountaintop in Appalachia, but it goes after a tried and true American theme about the individual versus the system. Now, Underground continues that legacy. This country was settled by civil libertarians seeking religious freedom from the tyranny of old Europe. Subsequently, our founding fathers continued this fight and won political liberty by breaking the chains of the world's most powerful empire. Underground is about the subsequent generation of American freedom fighters, the slaves who ran toward freedom to claim their own civil rights, defending and declaring that they, like all men and women, are created equal. The slaves and the abolitionists who aided them, they're heroes, American heroes, every bit the equal of the generation that hit the beaches in Normandy and those soldiers who defend freedom and equality today. Underground celebrates that heroism. Aside from our ambitious message, we are, after all, 
television executives. And we're ecstatic that we have a heart pounding, thrill a minute show. It's a story of the greatest escape in American history. It's also driven by the beat and soaring music that's supervised by our executive produ producer, who I frequently call our expecting producer because he and his wife are expecting a child <laughs> in April. None other than John Legend, who will be giving me notes on my speech after I end this. <laughs> Look, we love having the chance to air this sh show and air this show here, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Let me show you a little, a little clip from the show, a little trailer. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce our uh, creative team, those that were part of writing and directing and producing um, this film, uh, to talk a little bit about how this came to be and, and their thoughts as a result of it. Uh, please welcome Akivia Goldsman, who is the executive producer. John Legend, executive producer and director of music. Misha Green, creator, writer, and executive producer. Joe Pokaski, creator, creator, writer, and executive producer. Anthony Hemingway, executive producer and director. And president of WG, WGN America, Matt Chernis. Check, check. That's why it says push. Uh, reading is fundamental. Um, so, I, 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 Misha, I'd like to start with you. Um, saying, cr saying creator on a project is no small task. And what I'm interested in knowing is where were you when this idea came to you uh, and you had the courage to say, as opposed to doing one of the multitude of other projects you had, had done, that this was the project that you wanted to put your energy, uh, heart, and life into. Um, I think it started off really innocently. My sister actually said, you should do a TV show about the Underground Railroad. And I was like, Underground would be a really good <laughs> title. Mm -hmm. And I never come up with good titles, so that's where it started. And then I went to, Joe and I worked together on Heroes, and we wrote a script together. And usually, when you write with someone else, it turns into a war, and it's a disaster. But we actually ended with a script that was great and loved it. And I said to him, we should do a show about the Underground Railroad. And, and, and Matt, as a, as a TV executive, you, you get pitched all the time. The network gets pitched all the time with all kinds of projects. Um, and, and there are courageous executives and there are non-courageous executives. Um, why was this a script and a project uh, that you were interested in? Uh, well, other than uh, reading Peter's college essays, so I knew what to bring to him, no. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there, there's, a, there's obviously many reasons to pick up a show. I try and uh, narrow it down to, to three things. First and foremost, is it a world that's unique on television? There's obviously a lot of content out there, uh, a lot of stories that people want to tell. Uh, we look for things that are uh, unique and different and can stand out in a really competitive environment. Uh, the, the story of this plantation on Macon, Georgia, and the Underground Railroad was something that uh, I don't know that there had been ever a series that had dealt with it. Certainly there had been a few programs through the years, but nothing that had really lived in that world for a prolonged period of time. Uh, the second thing is, was it a script that uh, the characters and themes emotionally resonated with me uh, from the very beginning? And when you get to the end of that episode, uh, are you moved? Uh, do, are they characters that you can't deny coming back for? Uh, and uh, I thought you know, Joe and Misha had done just a wonderful job with all of the characters, giving each of them uh, a, a complexity and a reason to want to come back and, and thematics that, that felt like it was um, important to come back. 
And then I think the third thing, and probably the most important thing at all, of all, is uh, the uh, vision of the writers and the producers involved in a project. Uh, there's lots of good ideas out there, but there are very few uh, that have a vision behind them. Uh, and that vision goes more than just the words on the page. It goes for how the world looks and feels and smells and uh, and where it goes over many seasons. And the group of people here that you see on this stage uh, had a vision and a passion for telling the story. And I think without that, shows can, can founder, uh, maybe not after one episode, but certainly over time. And I think knowing the, the commitment of the group of people here, uh, their passion for it and the vision they had for the story uh, really made the whole project undeniable. Thank you, thank you so much. Jo Joe, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I, I think our, our, our scholars uh, created a, a real picture of the nuance mm -hmm. of, of this period, of, of this story. What was the vision for you um, as, as you were writing and, and, and part of this? What vision did you want to put out there for viewers, some of whom have never picked up a book about Underground Railroad, don't know anything about slavery, and are being introduced to this subject matter in a real way for the first time? Well, I think the you know probably the most important thing for Misha and I was to be bold, and and to kind of push the limits. And this story, it's kind of amazing. When we started doing research, everything we found was as exciting as any made-up fiction of a horrible. It's the most heroic story never told in American history. And if you just break down the idea of you're told you're someone else's property, and you get it in your head that no. I'm going to run 600 miles. I'm going to take it back. There's nothing more heroic than that. So I think what we wanted to do was really just take what used to be the square in your social studies book that oversimplified the whole thing and just really blow up all the all the real tales you've heard, the 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 real the heroism in do I run or do I not run? Do I help or do I not help? And kind of the more we read Truth is Stranger than Fiction and we just found these amazing real life stories of courage. Well, and, and it, please, Misha. When, when you talk about bold, and I think that that's what everybody on this panel brought, you know, we took storytelling wise, we want it to be exciting, we want it to be fast paced, we wanted it to be a thriller, and then we found Anthony who brought a visualness, a visualness, a visual style to it that was bold and really pushed the bar too, and then the same with John with the music and using contemporary music and really making this a show that it and making it feel like not only a story you haven't seen before but a way you haven't seen this area this time period depicted well and and i'm, I'm gonna take a point of personal privilege and be a parent for a moment uh, i have my 16 year old daughter with me who is uncomfortable taking people's seats um, but nobody's there baby so please sit next to journey uh, it's, it's all right it's okay she, she is going to hate me all night. Um, but, but, but we talked about bold and, and, and John, so, so for those of you that, that didn't get a preview packet, um, I, I turned on the first episode and I start hearing Kanye and I thought I had a browser still open. <laughs> And I'm like, what, what in the hell is going on? What, what? So, so no, talk, talk a little bit about how, and, and it was so interesting to me that, that you use these contemporary, uh, this contemporary music often in these moments of transition. So, so, so talk a little bit about your vision for that. Well, it actually started as Joe and Misha's vision. Uh, the first script they sent me said that they wanted black skinhead at the beginning of the episode. And... I just had to email Kanye and make sure we could get Black Skinhead. Um, <laughs> but the the reason why we did it, this word bold that um, Misha keeps using was something that we all drilled in our heads about how we wanted this series to come off. And the energy of the show is so urgent and present and um, timeless and universal. We didn't want the music to feel like it had to be bound to that era. Um, we wanted to take it off of the museum wall and make it feel really alive and, and present. And so that was part of the visual theme, but of course it was part of the musical theme as well for us to do that. And we also use Negro spirituals, we use other um, music from the period, but we, we, we've 
done it in innovative ways that blends it with current music as well. And I think it really works perfectly for the series because it gives it the energy that I think this the action deserves. But was there there's a was there a formula for you? Because because clearly you can be contemporary to a fault. Yeah, uh, I think it had to have the right kind of energy. It had the had the right sonics, and you know it's hard to discuss sonics, uh, but you kind of know it when you hear it. Um, certain things feel right. I thought Kanye's music felt right. It had the kind of raw energy that it, it needed to have. Um, we used some rock music. We used some country music. All of it had the kind of rawness that I think worked. And, and made it feel more timeless than, than some other music might. Thank you. Anthony, I, I read somewhere that you talked about it, it's challenging telling uh, a historical story uh, because in so many times it, it, it's difficult when someone can reference what the truth is. Um, but I think as, as was discussed earlier on the panel, this is one of the most unknown known stories. And so as you're directing, What's the challenge there as you're, as you're dealing with this story that you know people have heard the Underground Railroad over and over again, but the nuances of that story escapes most Americans in particular that will be looking at the screen? First of all, I want to say I love your socks. Thank you so much. Happy, happy socks is my, my brand. <laughs> um, this story is as old as time, but as contemporary as today's uh, headlines. And it really, demanded a fresh voice, a fresh approach, and it's definitely what uh, Joe and Misha laid the blueprint for us to follow. And I wanted to figure out a way on how I could make it appealing. And I think we made it sexy. Um, and I think in that way of doing it, it first of all, I think will help defy um, what anyone will come to the, to the, 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 the screen or wherever they watch it and see because we didn't want to tell a history lesson. We wanted to really kind of inspire, um, educate. Anything that I do, I want to count and, and matter and, and be effective. Um, so it was a responsibility and a, a huge take on for myself because it is a risk. You know, we wanted to be bold, but we wanted to do it right and be truthful to it as well. Um, and it was exciting. Um, historical stories are definitely challenging, but as you said, and we know that this story is that one to two sentences in our, our, our school history books. And there's so much we don't know. And to get to tell the story of these revolutionaries who were not fighting just for themselves but for a nation. And it, they're remarkable, amazing, and really are true American heroes. And I wanted every opportunity to celebrate that, to highlight that, and give it the swag that it needed. I, I saw that you said at a at a, a screening that you were concerned about the trivialization of the term slavery, um, and and how often there are comparisons that are made to slavery inaccurately. Uh, how has this story done a better job of providing a sense of what many of us could never imagine? Well, I think that, in fairness, as we all sit up here, we don't exactly know how to talk to you because um, the thing that we keep leaving out is how incredibly personal this object is for all of us. And you guys are smart. Uh, and we're thrilled to be here. Um, but this isn't just a piece of entertainment for any of us. Each and every person sitting on this stage has brought their own version of an imperative to tell a story. Um, I can't answer what makes this more edifying. I can tell you that for me, the very first group home for emotionally disturbed children was in my house. My parents founded it. And uh, so when my mother writes, there's always somebody hanging the baby from the wall or bouncing the baby out the window. I, I was the baby. And, uh, and it was that education that taught me how to write a beautiful mind. And I don't do television. I don't know much about television. But what isn't written about is my mother realized that there was no room for me in that house. So when I was seven days old, I was given to... Uh, 
a woman named Mary Elizabeth Lee who was born in Boyden, Virginia in 1937, and I was taken into her home, and she raised me, and she nurtured me, and she took me to church every Sunday, and she took me down south every summer, and I learned about color second. First, I learned about forgiveness. I learned about color second. First, I learned about what it means to be loved. And we've forgotten everything we knew, at least when I was in the 60s and 70s growing up. At least then, it wasn't the square in a textbook. At least it was a couple pages. I it's gone now. No one knows anything about the Underground Railroad. It is as if American heroes of color started with Harriet Tubman, and then Martin Luther King, and that's it. <laughs> huh, who knew? And they added another page for Obama. <laughs> so we were trying to say, the long way around, the answer to your question. We're trying to say that, as Peter alluded to, these were men and women who exhibited an incredible amount of courage and endurance for freedom. There is no more American story than that. These are American heroes, and the palette of American heroes isn't just white. And we get to say that. And so hidden amidst the beautiful entertainment is a truth we all are hoping to tell and give depth and texture to what is almost forgotten. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I appreciated the roundabout uh, to, to that answer. Thank you. Um, but but Misha, with that depth and texture, how did it feel when you began to go from words on paper and uh, actors cast in roles to this story actually coming to life um, in this environment that um, began to paint the picture for, for those that would be viewing it? You know, I think that... Um, I think we couldn't have ex expected it. We had the joy and the privilege of shooting on LSU at the Burden Museum, which has about 50 uh, historical period-specific structures. And we shot all of our slave shacks are actually real period-shaped slave, slave shacks. And I think when you step into that space, you know, you write something on the page. I write, you know, this family together in this place and you don't think about it until you're actually standing there and the importance of it and the weight of it. And I think that's something we both realized while we were shooting this. So the weight of it really started to hit us of the stories we were telling and how important they were. John, as you began to put together the, the music for this, is what surprised you most um, about not just the process, but how you were moved in the midst of creating for this piece? Well, I don't think I was surprised by the stories that were being told, but I, I think what was so special to me and exciting to me about um, getting in these editing sessions and, and really pouring over every detail of the show was just how interesting all of these lives are in, this, in the story. And every character, even if they're a villain, you, you really get to understand what their motivations are. and understand their humanity. Even if they're a slave catcher or a slave owner, you understand their humanity, you understand their motivations. Uh, you understand the motivation of the mother who decides that it's better for her and for her children for her to figure out how to survive on the plantation and not try to leave. You understand why those who want to leave and, and, and choose to leave and take that tremendously courageous step, why they do it. So it wasn't so much surprising, it was, um, illuminating and, and, and inspiring to see the complexity of these characters 
brought to life and know that we're going to put out this amazing television show that is doing something that no one's done before. Joe, can you build on that a little bit? Because to John's point, th there is this amazing complexity um, and no one's left out of that. Um, as, as, as I watched, uh, th there was no black and white per se. Uh, and and there, were, there were these human beings dealing with, with human, real human emotion in the midst of um, living in, in, in such a time. How important for you was it to ensure complexity across the board, as opposed to oftentimes when writers find one character that's complex and their simplicity uh, amongst all of these other people? Well, I think it, it was probably the most important thing to us. I think you know, Misha and I always try to write great characters. And again, uh, some of the resources available to her are amazing. Just one example of a woman basically saying, do I run or do I not run? And it introduced exactly that complexity, the idea of I've never known life off this plantation. I would leave my family behind. I don't know what's up north. The more complex things got, the more heroic these people were for making these choices. And it existed across, you know, the characters asking, you know, Jessica DeGao's character saying, do I open my home up and risk my home to what I think is right? How active is my activism is something we talk about a lot. And I think every character, you know, we tried to create with a different sense of what to do, what is right, and how brave I'm going to be. And then the actors took that and they ran with it and created even more complex characters. And also we have a very large cast, more of which you are not here today, but one of the reasons is because we just kept reading stuff and being like, oh, we have to tell that story and that story, like that one too. So I think that that was also a part of the world was finding that there was just so many stories to tell and that they hadn't been told yet. And, and from a, it, it should be noted that from a craft point of view, what these guys did is, I mean, we, we, we get very moved by our own find, our own discovery of what's meaningful in the object, but it's also a great piece of entertainment. And part of what these guys do beautifully is they surprise you. That the, the structure of the piece, the first one, the first four, the whole season is built on reversals, which is kind of what good narrative entertainment is. It creates a set of expectations, and then they, they go, no, no, you thought it was that? Turns out to be this. And that's part of what just makes it a really great piece of writing and then a great show. I agree, because I saw several of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anthony, w when, when you think about your own experience um, and, and coming into this project, what has uh, been the, the, the part of helping to put this together that has most changed you personally beyond what you experience professionally? First of all, you know, for me, it's, it's larger than me. You know, I, I always realize and, and, f and, and, and share that, you know, I, I, I've always believed that I've just been a vessel to channelize um, the stories that I, I gravitate toward. And this was one that to me, when I think about my legacy and when I leave this earth, I want everything that I do to matter and I don't want my living to be in vain. Um, and so for me, first and foremost, it comes from a spiritual place. Um, my own struggle um, definitely uh, is contributed to understanding and having the sensitivity to knowing how to handle uh, material like this. Um, but first and foremost, you know, I mean, I, I continue to walk the walk and, and let God lead me in the direction that I feel why I was purposed to do this. Um, because once I realized that it got my, the pressure got larger and heavier on my shoulders. Um, but as I know and am able to really uncover more of these stories, I, I, I it, it continues to give me strength um, when I can actually see, and that was one of the important things I, I was really excited about sharing more and more of the story because it's so unknown. And, and we can sit here all day long and say, you know, I know I come from greatness and from kings and queens, but when we actually get to see it, it's really just so much greater. Um, so it just, it continues to sharpen me um, as a person, as a filmmaker, um, 
No, I, I, yeah, I'd just like to add that everyone up here is being very modest about their contributions to this, but this was a very difficult production. It was difficult narratively, uh, it was difficult uh, emotionally, it was difficult uh, physically, and uh, the commitment that everyone on this stage and the actors mm -hmm. who you'll meet shortly um, put into this show was really remarkable. Uh, and I just think that, look, as a network that's just starting out and to beginning a brand, to see that kind of passion and commitment to not only uh, a show, but to a movement and to uh, a committing to a message, I think is just a really uh, remarkable thing and something that I know everyone at the network is thankful for and I think is very clear when, 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 when you look at this material and the way Anthony directed and the cast performed. Uh, you know, again, they can tell you a little more about it, but that the, the, it wasn't just cut and let's move on. You know, this was a this was a very different kind of show. Let me do this because uh, uh, before we bring the actors up, how many, by a show of hands, of you in this room are under the age of fifteen? All right, stand up for me if you're under the age of fifteen. Okay. Now, if which one of you? would like to represent your generation and ask this panel one question. She, she, she rose her hands quick. Come on, sis, come on. Hi. What's your name? O'Shea. What school do you go to? Oxen Hill. Oxen Hill, and how old are you? 14. Fantastic. So who would you like to ask a question to? John Legend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did not ever think that was going to happen. What's your question, sir? What inspired you to create the music that you created for Underground? Well, the only song that actually um, co-created for the, the show was um, the opening theme song. Um, and um, the idea behind the song was to directly mirror what was happening in the, in the show. Um, the uh, group of slaves that decides they're going to leave um, going to escape, they um, they use certain cues. Some of them can't read, uh, but they've heard songs um, that gave them clues about how to get to the north. And some of it was coded language. So they would talk about uh, various elements uh, that kind of clued them into going to, to the North Star or, or going to biblical places, as our scholars talked about before, that led them to the north. But we had to write about that in a song, and so that's what we did for the opening theme song of the show so that it, it explained what was happening in the plot of the show and explained what the various characters in the show um, were using to communicate to each other about how to escape. And what do you want to do when you grow up? Be an actor slash engineer. An actor slash engineer. Mm -hmm. I love it. Right. So, Misha, what advice would you give to her? as a young woman uh, trying to enter an incredibly competitive field. Be bold. <laughs> so we're we are going to transition panels at this point. So can we give our writers, producers, executive directors, uh, and creator a round of applause?